experience as a professional, practitioner, researcher, and volunteer. So welcome, Aaron. Okay, thank you, Iris. I think I stand between uh, you and lunch, so I will try to make this quick. And I just want to start out, you know, I think what Stan said earlier, I think what Stan, he's always very inspirational, at least to me, so I'm going to give him a quick uh, plug here. But, you know, he mentioned going beyond compliance, and I think that's kind of the question that we asked. Uh, this is uh, uh, some information uh, based in part on some research that uh, we uh, that I did, Stantec did, with ComEd. And it was really asking the question, you know, how do how can herbicides potentially uh, impact pollinators? So herbicides that we're using for IVM, for uh, habitat management, and so on and so forth. So a lot of it is is based on a literature review. Although today, given the time constraints, I will really be focusing at a high level and just really just giving some basic uh, information on the roles of herbicides in in habitat management. Kind of how do we use them? You know, why are, why are they important? Um, talk briefly on herbicides and pollinators is very briefly touching on some of that literature review. Um, and then spending probably the bulk of the time on uh, BMPs. And really, I think the need 10 here is just to really, you know, facilitate the discussion. You know, um, ComEd was asking the question, other utilities are asking the question. So I think it's just to kind of uh, initiate that discussion um, and uh, hopefully uh, in subsequent uh, working groups, we can have more detailed discussions. So obviously, you know, herbicides, uh, they're a type of pesticide and they're used to remove unwanted plants for a lot of different reasons. Obviously in the context that we're talking about today, it's for vegetation control, things like IVM, for habitat management, you know, maybe beyond IVM, that may include uh, more rigorous ecosystem restoration, like prairie or wetland restoration. And oftentimes when we're using herbicides, uh, there's, there's often multiple objectives. So it could be vegetation control uh, in combination with aesthetics, for, for example, or maybe you're using herbicides for health reasons, for example, to, re to remove a toxic plant. And there's a lot of different ways that we apply herbicides from a very large scale, high volume, um, down to a very highly selective um, low volume applications. And not all herbicides are created equal. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. But there's a lot of different herbicides on the market. I think if you go collectively to the various herbicide uh, pesticide manufacturers, there's a lot available on the market and can be potentially overwhelming um, when you are selecting what herbicides that you want to use, let alone um, determining how those may impact uh, wildlife, for example. So things, important distinctions, just to keep in mind is to just touch a few is the, the formulation of the herbicide, uh, the mode of action of the herbicide. That's basically uh, what plants is that herbicide going to specifically target? Is it going to target, for example, broadleaves or would it target all plants? There's obviously approved legal uses. Every uh, herbicide uh, registered for use uh, in the US has a label and the label is the law. So obviously we have to use herbicides according to the to legal uh, requirements. But above and beyond that, there's ecologically compatible uses. And that's for me kind of going beyond the compliance angle, you know, selecting herbicides um, that are the most appropriate to use at a particular site. And we use herbicides, they're an important tool, and we use them really across the habitat continuum. We use them at what you would call ecologically degraded sites, and we use them at very high quality uh, sites, sites that have high ecological integrity to manage vegetation. And uh, herbicide use is a chemical control. It's one of the several controls in the integrated vegetation management toolbox. Herbicides are a critical tool we absolutely need to be using them. Oftentimes it makes our tasks at hand with vegetation control economical, and oftentimes it is really the only way to remove unwanted vegetation. But herbicide is not the only thing that we could be doing. Obviously we, we talk a lot about IVM in this group, so mechanical control, controls, things like mowing, uh, biological controls, things that we probably don't use as much, but using biological control agents to control certain vegetation, and cultural controls, things like um, seeding and other things that we do to enhance plant communities. And like all control methods, herbicides come with benefits and liabilities. So 
I put this graphic together, this picture, okay, you're, you're planning a vegetation management program and you go to the herbicide store. And there's really no herbicide store, but you know, you go online, there's a lot of different products to choose from. It can be, it can be overwhelming. Like I said earlier, you know, you're going to find hundreds of products on the market potentially. And um, what, the way we communicate really when it comes to herbicide, there's several different ways to communicate on, on the types of herbicide that you may be using. One frequently uh, used terminology is called common name. And this refers to essentially uh, the active ingredient of a particular herbicide formulation. So there's lots of different active ingredients uh, from glyphosate, which is a active ingredient in the formulation Roundup, which you may be using around your home or garden. Um, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of different uh, common names on the market. And we kind of split these into, you know, if you kind of break it down to the, the shelf at the shopping store, you might find a non-selective shelf, you might find a broadleaf herbicide shelf, um, broadleaf woody, ones that are usually more on woody species, uh, graminicides or grass-specific herbicides. Then you have your aquatics, ones that are registered for use in aquatic settings. So there's a lot of benefits to using herbicides. One thing that I do frequently as an ecosystem restoration practitioner is use herbicides to help convert habitats. And the reason we do this is a lot of the plants that are on the sites that we're converting are maybe incompatible, they're non-native, they're invasive, we don't want them there. And because they're perennial plants, uh, one of the methods to remove them short term, most economically, is by using uh, herbicides. So here's a before and after shot. On the left is a picture um, of a site, um, kind of baseline condition. And then the picture on the right is a site, a picture of a, the same site looking in the same direction four years later. And that the, the really catalyst for that was use of herbicides to re remove that vegetation and then um, seeding, um, installing native plants to, um, to restore, in this case, a prairie and pollinator habitat. And when we're doing this, oftentimes it's, it's a large volume and we're using often non-selective herbicides. In many other cases, including I would say even with IVM, we are using much more selective techniques. We are very, removing very specific species that we don't want on a site, whether it be a, wheat, a woody incompatible tree or a tree in this case, uh, it could be an herbaceous invasive species. Um, so our treatments that we're using are very different than you would use for a conversion. Um, we are typically using on a, on a higher quality site, uh, very selective techniques and often different herbicides. So it's important to consider, you know, what are your goals of the application? Why are you using the herbicide? And what are you, what are you hoping to achieve? So next I'll talk uh, just briefly on herbicides and pollinators, kind of just touching briefly on some of that uh, literature review. And the goal is again, not to get too far in the weeds, but just kind of give a, a high level perspective. So um, I'll talk about the limitations of uh, the literature review a little bit in a, in a few slides here, but um, there, in, in general, uh, the thought is based on the research that is out there, there's two potential uh, effects from use of herbicides on pollinators. One is indirect effects. And this is probably the most prevalent potential effect. And this is essentially when uh, your herbicide use is causing a decline, for example, in food supply, you know, so you're, you're uh, potentially using herbicides that are impacting plants, um, off-target plants, for example, that would provide um, habitat for pollinators. You might um, accidentally remove host plants uh, when you're using herbicides. So the general net effect is that uh, if you are using herbicides in a manner that degrades the pollinator habitat, it's going to lead to less use by pollinators. Now, just a caveat, herbicides are, the, are not the only activity that could reduce uh, habitat quality for pollinators. For example, if you mow a site when it's in full flower, you're removing the flowers and you could potentially impact um, the pollinator population temporarily um, in that case. I think a lot of the questions that are out there are on the potential direct effects and direct effects are results that may, uh, uh, may occur from direct exposure of pollinators to herbicides and herbicide adjuvants. So an adjuvant is anything that's added to an herbicide formulation to assist, to enhance the effect of the herbicide. Surfactants would be a common one. Surfactants are added to herbicides and they're added to insecticides to help the herbicide active ingredient penetrate the plant, penetrate the insect, for example. So direct effects can occur when a pollinator is sprayed in the line of fire, when you're doing the application, 
And uh, direct effects can occur when a pollinator ingests the chemicals um, during feeding. And so if you have a site that you've sprayed and you've sprayed flowers or you've, you've sprayed any, any vegetation really and a pollinator ingests either the nectar or the pollen or the pollinator lands on a plant that has been recently sprayed, it could, it could theoretically be exposed in a, in a harmful manner to that chemical. Um, just keep in mind, you know, think about the scenarios here. There's, there's probably pretty limited potential for um, these direct effects in a lot of cases. Number one, um, what, again, what, what are the chances that a pollinator is actually going to be sprayed in that line of fire? And then number two, some of the herbicides that are commonly used, uh, number one, they dry quickly in the plant, and number two, they are designed to kill the plant pretty quickly. So uh, there may be a, a, a brief period of uh, several days where uh, an herbicide may be directly affected by, um, by a chemical. So the, really, the, the studies that are out there on the direct effects um, are, are really, uh, quite honestly, somewhat limited, and maybe not limited in number, but limited in um, conclusions. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but um, so kind of breaking down the direct effects, there's potential lethal effects. And those typically result from a very high concentration or dosage of a, an active ingredient to a test subject like a honeybee and um, results in acute toxicity. So basically killing uh, a pollinator, for example, a honeybee. Um, I would say those are rare because typically those higher concentrations are not uh, used in the field. Um, so really the, the literature is pointing to um, mostly sublethal effects of herbicide use. And so these would typically occur during lower concentration or doses. You're not actually killing a pollinator, for example, but you are um, impacting uh, its behavior, for example, through impaired cognition, through food sensitivity, uh, learning impairments, or physiological effects. So you're potentially, um, some, of the, some of these chemicals may cause these sublethal effects. Not all herbicides show these effects. Uh, there's inconsistent results between studies, and some of the, some of the studies, this is, a, this is a very complicated uh, manner to study, actually, to, to get the control that you need, either in a laboratory setting or a field setting. So they often lack conclusive cause and effect. So you have to be cautious in how you're interpreting some of the results of the studies. There's a lot of information gaps. I think this slide is worth putting up and emphasizing. Not all herbicides and adjuvants have been studied, number one. Some get more attention than others. Glyphosate. Think Roundup, it's in the news, gets a lot of attention uh, in academics and otherwise. Uh, inert ingredients uh, and adjuvants are proprietary. So inert ingredients, uh, every herbicide formulation has what's technically called an inert ingredient. It's things that are not pesticidally, pesticidally active. Um, and all adjuvants, all surfactants, they're proprietary. And what does that mean? It means that they're not regulated. It means that uh, a pesticide manufacturer does not have to disclose the inert ingredients in a formulation. So there's some question there and it makes it difficult to study cause and effect if you're looking at the effects of a formulation and you don't know what's in it. So obviously lab tests are then often only performed on the active ingredient. Um, I would say that relative to other areas of the world, especially Europe, um, US testing requirements are relatively basic. Um, the main uh, test for registration of herbicide and its effect on pollinators is only on honeybees and it's only an acute oral dose. So Europe is looking at expanded um, testing requirements to look at um, sublethal effects, uh, chronic toxicity, and exposure pathways for herbicides. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. Test concentrations vary in, in studies. Exposure pathways vary. Uh, when combined, multiple active ingredients may have unique effects. So for example, if you mix two herbicide formulations, it may cause a different effect than a single, a single formulation. Um, there may be multiple formulations of an active ingredient. So it's not always apples to apples. You might not be able to say, for example, glyphosate is causing an effect because there might be two different formulations of glyphosate and you might have two different sets of inert ingredients and those inert ingredients may actually cause the effects. Uh, formulations change over time. Some of the formulations that we use for a lot of our agrochemical pesticide, uh, pes pesticides and herbicides have been around um, or at first formulated decades ago, and those formulations change over time. And there's limited pollinators that have been studied. Uh, generally, the focus has been on, on honeybees. So sitting here, it's difficult, and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to make a specific recommendation for or against a specific herbicide. Um, 
So how, where, and when a certain chemical is used is, is probably more important based on the information that we have right now. But again, I think it's worth discussing. Um, there's ongoing research. We're doing an ongoing literature review. There are studies being published uh, frequently, even as recently as uh, several in the last month. So it's an ongoing question that people are looking at. So now I'll jump into BMP. So the how, the when, the where, an herbicide is used is probably more important. So one thing that we can do to, to potentially minimize impacts on pollinators is to be really careful about how we use herbicides. So number one, this, the, the baseline is herbicide is a law, but then from there, you know, what, what is the, what is the things that we can do above and beyond compliance? How we can use BMPs or develop BMPs? And really for me, it all starts with training and qualifications, making sure that um, the staff that you have on a, on a, on a site are, are trained and qualified. And then from there, it's breaking down um, into uh, various BMPs um, that would um, uh, potentially reduce impacts on pollinators. And I'll review those briefly. So number one, training and qualifications, uh, select the right herbicide and adjuvants for the job. You know, I think a big one here is identifying, being, being able to identify target and non-target plants. You know, for example, getting on a site and, and really understanding uh, what you're to spray and what you're to not spray. Um, and then really being adaptive. Uh, not every site, even from span to span, for example, on a transmission right away is the same. They may call for different application techniques. So understanding, you know, as you, as you get to a site, doing some planning and assessment, there may be a site where you have a target uh, incompatible, undesirable shrub or tree, for example, in this case, the, the, the plant around this tower is, is buckthorn. It's a target for removal. Um, but right around the buckthorn, growing actually right next to it, potentially underneath are, are pollinator plants. So understanding that and, and really adapting your uh, application techniques to, to minimize impacts on those pollinator plants. Um, awareness and adaptive management. Um, so again, as I mentioned, moving from span to span conditions may change and it may require uh, adaptations in your application techniques and even your herbicides that you're using. So you may jump from a very low quality site where you can be a little bit more aggressive with your applications um, to a high quality site where you're gonna be want, want to be much more selective. Um, chemical selection. So in general, we want to select those that have the least threat to the environment. You know, use selective formulations. Select those with low drift and runoff potential ones that are not going to move around in the environment after you apply them. Select those with low residual and select those with um, um, low toxicity, essentially. Same thing for adjuvants. Um, use those that are really naturally derived if you can, if they have proven uh, uh, effectiveness on your targets. Application techniques, using the lowest concentration and lowest volume possible to achieve the intended outcome. So really a high volume foliar, like I talked about earlier, it's, it's high volume. You're, you're, you're putting a lot of herbicide out. It could be potential a lot of um, negative effects down to something like a, a basal bark or a cut stump treatment where it's a much more targeted low volume application. And then if you're doing it right, you your herbicide use should decrease over time. So you should be using less herbicide as you convert a site, establish it, and moving to a, uh, to a full, uh, re fully restored site. So this is just a hypothetical example of decreasing volume with time and hopefully within a cycle or two of IVM or within five years on a habitat restoration, you, you shouldn't be using a lot of herbicide. Um, and then application timing, uh, certainly something to consider maybe at the site scale, it can be a little bit difficult at a very large scale, um, but avoiding conditions when herbicides may move around, don't apply them in high wind, don't apply them in de dewy conditions uh, when some pollinators uh, may not be able to fly uh, normally um, at a very site spe uh, specific scale, applying them when maybe pollinators aren't as active, either seasonally or a time of day, applying them when floral resources are low. And that is my last point here. I think another really important control is ecological function. Really going, this is above and beyond compliance, getting your sites to a point where they don't need a lot of uh, intervention from you. They're taking care of themselves. So we know that natural systems with intact processes are more resistant to change. So those are going to be less likely to be invaded by things that you don't want. Um, and reducing your reliance on herbicides over the long term, I think, should be uh, really the goal here.
And with that, that's that's it. Thanks so much, Aaron. Any questions? <laughs> Any couple quick questions for Aaron? Yeah, I was just interested to hear if you have any comment on herbicide resistant plants and whether that um, will have an effect on right away integrated vegetation management. So most of the herbicide resistance that um, is has occurred or is developing is typically in agricultural settings. Um, it does affect what herbicides they use and how they use them. So if you have you know a right away next to uh, an agricultural field, for example, they may be using herbicides that could potentially uh, drift onto your right away because they're using different formulations that may be more susceptible to drift. But there's other ways to control that as well. You know, as far as right away applications, um, I, I'm not aware of anything uh, as far as, uh, uh, say, target woodies, for example, that would be um, an issue, have an issue with herbicide resistance. It's mostly with our egg, um, our egg weeds. Well, thanks again, Aaron.